Hey, I'm John Dervage with Our Revolution Colorado Springs. Uh, with me today is Meg Fossiner, who is running for Colorado House District 20. Um, so can you just start by telling me a little bit about yourself and why you're uh, running for that position? Yeah, I am a social worker. Um, so I have worked almost 15 years now working with people from a wide variety of populations. I've worked with adults with severe mental illness. I've worked with um, victims of sexual assault and domestic violence, as well as with offenders. And I've spent the last 15 years fighting on the front lines of our community. I, time and time again, have been disappointed because the systems that are meant to serve those who need them are, are Wow. Um, the systems that are meant to serve those who need them, yeah. unfortunately, do not serve them oh, wow. consistently. And so I am running because I want to change that. Um, there is an only $130 gap, actually, between making the minimum wage in our state, working 40 hours a week, and being completely cut off of food stamps. Oh, wow. And so when we think about that number, that number is 2200 and what's not, it's $2,080. Yeah. And at that point, you completely lose food stamps. Wow. Living here in Colorado Springs, we know that $2,080 is not enough to afford rent. Yeah, it's sure. not enough to afford food and to pay for all of those other living expenses. And so really, my focus is on justice for all. Mm -hmm. And that includes things like tackling that system so that people are able to move up from making minimum wage mm -hmm. and working 40 hours a week to being able to get a raise, to being able to be, accept a higher job offer and be able to afford their bills. Yeah, because that's something that I find really surprising about this area. I mean, Colorado as a whole is definitely experiencing this sort of uptick and basically the price of everything. How often have they changed those rates for Colorado Springs? Like, has it always been, you know, that roughly 2000 or is it, is it like, gradually going up, I guess, like what really sets that those rates? So those rates are set both by the federal government, but also by the state. Mm -hmm. And so our legislators have some control over what that program looks like, um, but they don't have full control. You know, it's similar to Medicaid, where yep. when the Affordable Care Act was passed, states were able to adopt the Affordable Care Act in full. They were able to add to it, make changes. Um, and you ask a good question. I'm actually not sure when the last time was that they adjusted that. Yeah, because I mean, I think that's something that I always get kind of upset with is the idea that things like the housing market mm -hmm. is uh, it's driven by it's driven by the market, the demand. Right? There's a lot of people who want to live in the area, uh, and there's a lot of increase in the rent because of that. Uh, and uh, I just recently was through the, went through the process of trying to buy ho a house and. Uh, the market's really, really hard. Like it's really difficult, and um, if you don't have a way to, I think either subsidize or increase the amount of affordable housing, like what does that leave people? Like it leaves people in places that are uh, either not safe or places that you know are out on the street, which we see way too often in Colorado Springs. Absolutely, um, and if we look at Colorado Springs specifically, you know, in the last. 12 months, we've had multiple low-income apartment buildings close. Yeah. And some of it was because of safety issues, valid safety issues. And we absolutely need to find the balance between people living in housing that's affordable, but also that's safe. Yeah. Colorado Springs City Council and our mayor have actually done some great things with that lately and have been partnering with um, some private companies that are looking to build affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And the way that they're doing that is by figuring out how Colorado Springs as a city can support them by either offering land or by offering other ways to, you know, increase the amount of affordable housing in Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something we can look at at the state level as well. Yeah. Um, how do we bring more investors in? Um, but not investors who are building housing that's unaffordable, mm -hmm. um, but investors who are really willing to provide safe housing yeah. to people who need it. Yeah, exactly. And I think to uh, have making sure that like safety regulations are in place because way too often what we what I've heard are 
uh, it's cheaper to you know skip out on some of those safety inspections. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of times when people buy a property, they don't even go through an inspection process if they plan on renting it or if it's an investment property because they're not living there, Mm -hmm. you know. So. And, or, you know, there's, oh, there's mold in the ceiling. Well, we'll get around to it eventually until, you know, maybe they won't notice. Even though they're breathe, mm-hmm. people who are living there, they're, you know, giving them money are breathing that air every day. So uh, do you, are there plans to, or like, I guess my question is, what are like the local laws that relate to like how, you know, I guess landlord's responsibility to maintain like a safe living environment? Because I've heard that like Colorado is pretty... Uh, rent renter or landlord friendly mm-hmm. so is that part of the, why that uh, exists or that like conception exists yeah and that's part of it um, I will say that last year the state legislature passed legislation that requires landlords who are receiving state vouchers to have standards that are safe mm-hmm. um, and to meet those expectations and so that was a tremendous step forward. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, there's also a lack of vouchers. And what we find is that even people who have housing vouchers aren't always able to find landlords that then accept them. Mm-hmm. And so it's really important that the state looks into that further and figures out how to encourage landlords to accept those housing vouchers. Yeah. Because it does somebody no good if they receive a Section 8 voucher, for sure. yeah. but then there's nowhere for them to use it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I've been really proud of our state legislators this year because they've actually done a lot to protect tenants' rights. Um, and one of the bills that I'm thinking of off the top of my head is a bill that, there's actually two, um, So there's one bill that protects people's immigration status and Mm -hmm. says that landlords are not able to ask that question, which is really important. Yeah, for sure. Um, It's not the landlord's business. They don't need to know that. Um, Yeah. Well, I mean, there's always like a clause that says like you're not allowed to discriminate. And it seems like those kind of go hand in hand because you Mm -hmm. can just easily discriminate by that kind of question. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And then the other bill that I'm thinking of is a bill that says landlords can't discriminate based on where somebody's income is coming from. And so when you think about people who maybe work in jobs that the landlord doesn't agree with, Mm -hmm. um, they have the income, they can prove the income, this bill would protect them from facing that discrimination from their landlord. Awesome. Um, So the Colorado State Assembly, I feel like, has done some good work, but there's Definitely more work to be done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So going off of some of your other experience as like a like a social worker, you know, like uh, mental health is like there's a, you know, it's an almost an epidemic in this country right now of like the idea of people being um, not you know having ab- ability to seek proper uh, treatment or you know they just don't necessarily know where to go, um, and this affects you know large large amounts of our population, but mm-hmm. specifically also the homeless population, yeah. uh, is what, what's like, in what way can we expand like the way that the current coverage is available for, you know, those type of people, people who are living out in the streets? Yeah. So I think that it's really important that we increase our walk-in clinics. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the biggest challenges is that people who are in crisis have minimal options. Um, Their option in many places in our state is to go to the emergency room um, where they'll then be evaluated and they will either be hospitalized or they will be sent home. Mm -hmm. And there's that that's too wide of a spectrum. And so having places like Aspen Point and El Paso County and Colorado Springs who can provide walk-in services that are therapeutic, that are goal-focused, and and that can really meet those needs is crucial to being Mm -hmm. able to serve the population because not everybody who's experiencing a mental health crisis needs hospitalized. For sure, yeah. Um, Hospitalization hopefully is our last resort for people who are a threat to themselves or Mm -hmm. to others not somebody who is saying, I am really depressed or I'm really anxious and I I need 
X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Um, there's also a, a really um, big challenge with getting people in to see psychiatrists. Um, mm-hmm. There's a significant shortage of psychiatrists, and being able to access them without a waiting period is quite a challenge. Um, so I think trying to focus on that. So what's, what, um, like, based off of your experience, what's the cause of having a lack of, like, um, psychiatrists and is it and is that specific to like this area or is that just kind of like nationwide? It's a good question. I haven't looked nationwide, mm-hmm. um, and I, I don't know the cause. I think it's really important though that we look into it. Yeah. And it's like many things. There's I'm sure many contributing factors, and there's no one easy solution, right? Mm-hmm. It would be great if we could say we're going to put a mental health clinic on in every city and we're going to fund it and that's going to be the answer to all of the problems. Um, But there's usually not just one. Interesting. Yeah. Because I I feel like the going to like almost like an urgent clinic, like it takes like a special, you know, I'm I'm sure a special amount of training and like being able to know how to necessarily handle like certain situations and how what people are going through that like a typical like general physician would not be able to probably properly diagnose or treat. Yeah. So I feel like, yeah, having access to people who are specialized in, um, and does that also relate to counselors too? Or is that like, is there kind of like a difference? Cause like when I think of psychiatrist versus counselor, like mm-hmm. in my mind, I'm just kind of thinking of like two separate um, professions. So they are connected, but they are two separate roles. Okay. Um, so, as a general rule, counselors and therapists have master's level degrees yeah. and are not able to prescribe medications. I got it. Okay. Um, whereas psychiatrists are doctors yeah. um, that also have a focus in the mental health field and so are able to prescribe. And that prescribing is one of the challenges. And so I work with juveniles who are coming out of facility which means that many of them have ongoing prescriptions because Mm -hmm. while they've been in custody or while they've been in um, treatment, they have received care from their psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And transitioning into the community, it's kind of hit or miss as to if a primary care doctor is willing to continue those prescriptions or if they refer them to a psychiatrist. Okay. And that lapse occasionally means that we have people going off their medications. Yeah. Um, and that the only option then is to go into an urgent care or to go into an emergency room, which isn't ideal, yeah. right? Like mm-hmm. when we think about healthcare costs, it's a whole lot cheaper for us to pay for a primary care doctor, for us to pay for a therapist, than it is for us to pay for somebody to go to the emergency room. Yeah. And so making sure that those low-level interventions are available and people don't need to go to the high-level intervention to get help yeah. is crucial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think something else that I, I'm curious about as well is like there's, I can think of a lot of examples for like me personally where you know people want to seek help uh, in a sense, like almost physically, like me- medically, they have something wrong with them, mm-hmm. but they are worried about the cost of that, right? Mm-hmm. They're worried that they're not going to be able to afford it or that they're, um, you know, deductible, you know, deductible is too high. They're not going to be able to cover that. Um, do you see that as well uh, in, the, in the mental health uh, realm? Very much so. Um, imagine if you are needing to go see your primary care physician and pay that copay every week. Yeah. And so that that adds up costs really quickly. Um, So when we think about private insurance, most of them cover therapists either at the primary care physician level or the urgent care. Mm -hmm. And I mean that for a lot of people at minimum is $100 out of pocket per month. Um, And that's not feasible. Yeah, that's really hard. I mean, and it that just seems like it's a critical uh, care that they, people may need that mm-hmm. if they can't afford. Um, and I know, you know, this is something that's covered under Bernie Sanders' uh, Medicare for All plan is um, mental health is included in that. Mm-hmm. Um, is that something that you agree with as well? Like, you think that should be the, um, the right path? Absolutely. Um, actually, a f- few years ago, I had pretty significant health problems. And as that cycle, that my story is like many other story. I got sick, I lost my job, I lost my insurance, 
I had all of these medical bills and I was on the verge of bankruptcy. Yeah. And it is really difficult to understand why we live in the richest country in the world and people are faced with a choice between getting medical care or bankruptcy. Yeah. And between getting medical care and food. Yeah. And getting mental health care and paying rent. Yeah. And that exactly. is really unacceptable to me. Yeah. I mean, considering all of those, you know, things are, I would say, essential to a successful life and a happy life. Because that's, I think, the other thing, too, is there's the trauma that goes along with, you know, not being able to afford something that you desperately need. Mm -hmm. And then you also have to worry about, you know, food and rent. I mean, that's just so much stress in a person's life. Um, you know, there's the saying going around about like diseases of despair, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the despair of, and I think the despair of debt is one of those things as well, where people are just getting bogged down with more and more debt. So um, transitioning then to just another topic, I think it's really important a lot of, for a lot of people in Colorado is uh, climate change. And like our role, you know, in, in this community, we value, especially in Colorado Springs, the beauty of our mountains and mm -hmm. of Garden of the Gods, all these you know, beautiful landmarks. Um, what's your, what's your uh, opinion on climate change moving forward? Like, do you, what's kind of like, in a nutshell, what you would like to see mm -hmm. in, in this area to address that? You know, we have to stop being on the defensive about climate change and we need to start focusing on the offensive. Mm -hmm. And so I actually live in the foothills. I grew up in this beautiful town with um, have had the joy of hiking Cheyenne Canyon yeah. um, throughout most of my adult life and love it. Yeah. Um, it is where my heart is and it is where home is. Yeah. And unfortunately, I was here um, when Waldo Canyon fire burned and also when Black Forest burned. I volunteer for the American Red Cross, and so I was a disaster responder, and I responded to both of those. Mm -hmm. And it's devastating. Yeah. The reality is that as our climate changes, we are learning that the trees that used to grow in the Waldo Canyon area actually no longer grow there, um, and that many of them are, are not seeding. They're not coming back because the climate's different. Yeah. And so aspen are much more likely to grow than many of our evergreens. Mm -hmm. And so what I would like to see in Colorado specifically is a shift where we really begin to invest in sustainable and renewable resources. Mm -hmm. And I work a lot with the workforce centers um, throughout the state and know that they have some amazing opportunities those need to be more widely publicized. And yeah. we also really need to provide support for job training for people to transition over from oil and gas into yeah. sustainable um, jobs. And I think that it's doable. You know, there was just the report that came out not too long ago about how oil and gas hasn't been reporting for a lot of the profits. And that's unacceptable. They need to be held accountable to that. Mm -hmm. um, and we also really need to make a shift in how we are offering subsidies, what we're offering subsidies for. Yeah. And I, I think it's very manageable. Yeah, I think uh, I think you hit on a very good point with the idea of like a, a just transition for people who work in the oil and gas industry. Uh, uh, and I think that was a big, a big reason, you know, why you know, Colorado, a while back, I think, what, at this point, two years ago, uh, one and a half years ago, tried to get a ban on fracking and, and, and to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a lot of opposition against that. It was, oh, it's going to hurt our economy. It's going to hurt our workers. Like, you know, and there really wasn't anything in that plan specifically, and I, you know, addressing that, tra how that transition would take place. Mm -hmm. So I think that sort of fear of a lot of, you know, people who work in, in that area would have to, you know, move somewhere else or how negative it would affect our economy. Um, I mean, do you think that that kind of approach is, is better or like kind of that's a good like reason on why we need that just transition? Yeah, I think it's a very valid concern when you say, well, how am I going to feed my family? Yeah. Because everybody can share that concern. And I share that concern, right? Mm -hmm. And so making sure that we are providing alternative ways, that we are providing that training, and that we're supporting people in making that transition, 
Because nobody wants families that can't feed themselves yeah. and that can't afford the roof over their head. And so I, I, I fully support a just transition, as you said, um, and one that allows people to feel comfortable in making that shift. Mm -hmm. And I think another uh, question that I always have is, you know, we always hear about these discussions at the national level happening at like the federal government level. Uh, at the state level, how does that conversation change? Like you mentioned, like there's, you know, more awareness can be raised to certain, you know, certain programs that, that occur at the state level. But, you know, what, uh, as like a, a state representative, um, can, can change to make this state like more sustainable? Yeah, I really think it's, it has a lot to do with the budget, right? And mm -hmm. so really looking at where we're spending our money and how that money is serving our, our people in Colorado. Um, and if it's not serving people, if it's serving corporations instead, mm -hmm. we need to make changes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 that's something too, I think people don't I think necessarily always realize the importance of, of local positions and like how much that can affect their lives. And I agree, like, um, and the concept too of money in politics like occurs at every you know every level so absolutely um can you tell me a little bit about so right now uh there there's like a primary process right mm -hmm. like so can you walk us through like what people will need to do to uh, get your support or to vote for you or to get you to make sure you're on the ballot and just kind of that process because i think Colorado is kind of confusing with the, you know, there's people caucusing, people petitioning and all of that. We changed a whole bunch of stuff this year. And yes. it is It is quite confusing. Yep. Um, so the primary for the president was Tuesday, earlier yep. this week. We will be caucusing on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And Saturday is when we will decide everybody from the National Senate seat down. At caucus, you can ask to be a delegate. Mm -hmm. And so delegates will then go to county assembly. And at county assembly is where people who live in Colorado House District 20 will be able to support me to get on the ballot. Um, and by offering their support, I need 30% of the vote um, in our breakout session to get on the ballot. I will be um, either have a primary in... June, I believe, mm -hmm. um, and at, on the primary, they everyone will be able to vote again and determine who will be on the November ballot. And so it's my hope that I will be able to go into El Paso County Assembly and earn a place on the ballot, and then my hope is in November to be able to say that we have turned House District 20 blue. Yeah, how... Uh... How long has has House District been blue for? Like, I guess that's the other question too. Is there's a lot, always a lot of like um, question on like how long districts because these districts are basically made based off of like census. So yeah. how how old is like uh, District Twenty? You know, I'm. That's a good question. You're asking some really good Sorry, questions, I just, and I don't know the answer. <laughs> well, like, I, I guess the more important is like, is it you know like? Um, you, so I'm assuming right now it's like it's a red district. House District 20 is pretty conservative, yeah. um, and so it's going to be an uphill climb, um, which excites me. Yeah. I am a, I'm a fighter. I'm a fighter for justice. My, my campaign slogan, which I kind of hate that term, um, <laughs> is justice for all, because all of the topics that we've talked about today fall under justice, yeah. and I will, I will fight for justice whether I win in November or whether I lose. And I, I hope that people will join yeah. in that fight. And that sounds like a message I believe almost everyone sh should be able to get behind. Right. I mean, I, the, <laughs> and I think there's this, um, you know, I think there's progressive values and just like the idea of like having uh, messages that apply to everyone. <laughs> um, and most of the time those messages are widely popular because they apply to everyone. Yeah. So, um yeah, I think that I, that's actually, I like that campaign slogan. Mm -hmm. I think it's very, very meaningful. So Thank you. And I agree. I mean, our Pledge of Allegiance yeah. says justice for all. Yeah. And we are not living up to that promise. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I say it's a conservative district, but we all share the same goals. Mm -hmm. We have different ideas about how to get there. But we all share in the same goals of having quality education for our children. We all share the goal of having access to health care that we can afford. 
we all share in the goal of protecting our environment yeah. and having clean air and clean water. Yeah. And so when I think about justice, I, I think about those things. Um, and I, I think we all share in those goals. We just yeah. have different paths there. Yeah.